Chapter Eighteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Big Drought. Shearing was over. The Unionists had struck their camp and retired beaten, and Munda Station resumed its normal attitude. Wyndham Hanworth accompanied Ida Bryce and his sister to Sydney, and Herbert Golding had commenced the sitting for his portrait. Eli Spence and his mates were committed for trial on a charge of incendiarism and assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. Sergeant Tyler wished attempted murder to be included in the charge, but Edward Bryce begged him not to push it so hard against the men. The information Tyler received about Eli Spence related, strangely enough, to the murder of Henry Bryce. He gave Edward Bryce a hint as to the nature of the communication, but Ted did not think it of much importance. He could not see what object Eli Spence had in murdering Henry Bryce. Ted Bryce remained at Munda. The shearing had been good, better than he anticipated, and some of the men had departed with big cheques, as much as seventy pounds being earned by some of them. A lot of this hard-earned money found its way into the pockets of Dame Killam at the Kangaroo. Some of these shearers are careless fellows, and take no thought for the morrow. No sooner do they knock up a cheque, than they at once proceed to knock it down at the nearest drinking den. Mrs. Warden always reaped a rich harvest when shearing was over. She had captured two of her husbands after shearing time at Munda. Edward Bryce tried to persuade the men to have their cheques drawn on a Sydney bank, and made only negotiable there, but the bulk of them refused. He knew very well before they reached Sydney, the greater part of their money would be gone. Sam Fraser, the trainer, had been sent to Randwick with the Phantom Colt, and two other horses, with instructions to train the youngster and see how he shaped. No rain had fallen for weeks in the western district. The sun blazed down upon the parched ground, and shrivelled up every green blade of grass, and burnt the life out of the earth. It was fearfully hot, and the thermometer went up to a hundred and eighteen in the shade. Edward Bryce knew if rain did not fall within a week, it would be a very serious matter indeed. The river Darling was no longer navigable. It had been dry for some months, and now the tremendous heat put the finishing touch on it. Thousands upon thousands of sheep were dying, and thousands more would follow if rain did not fall. Another week passed, and still no rain. There was hardly a cloud in the sky. It was brilliantly clear, and of a dazzling blue. At night, the intense heat of the day abated somewhat, but everything was hot to the touch, as though it had been taken out of a furnace and left to cool. A dense haze, almost like a mild fog, hung around the homestead, and seemed to choke every waft of cool air that swept across the arid plains. Ted Bryce sat on the veranda with Wide Awake, who had just come in from a ride of many miles. "'This is terrible, Mr. Bryce,' he said. "'I never saw the like of it before. There's not a blade of grass to be seen for miles, and the run is just one bare brown plain.' "'We'll ride out tomorrow, said Ted, and make an inspection.' Next day the heat was as intense as ever. There was no avoiding the piercing rays of the sun. They penetrated everywhere. Mile after mile Ted Bryce rode, and on all sides saw nothing but desolation. Even the wild animals and birds had at last given in. Thousands of rabbits were seen lying dead in every direction, and in some places they lay piled up under the trees in heaps. Scores of kangaroos, emu, and other native animals were lying about dead. The stench in places was abominable, but it could not be avoided. A great plague had fallen upon the land. It was the drought plague, a terrible scourge, more to be feared than the ravages of a pestilence or disease. "'Unless we have rain before Christmas, it will be awful,' said Edward Bryce, "'and with January to look forward to.' heaven knows what will become of us we generally have rain in january here said wide awake it's a good month for rain up our way so it is said ted but i was thinking of the heat 
showers will do no good now we want a deluge it was pitiable to see the carcasses and bleached bones of thousands of sheep lying about in places hundreds of them had huddled together and died the water holes were so blocked up with carcasses and the smell was so terrible that ted bryce rode hastily away we've used a hundred tons of lucerne and wheat and hay during the last ten months said ted it's lucky we grow it here and that it costs but little to produce i remember my father told me in the big drought ten years ago it cost munda station three thousand for feed and carriage at the rate of thirty pound a ton had to be paid that was ruinous said wide awake i always thought it was a wise plan when you started to grow your own feed it's a grand thing to have a supply in a bad season by jove said ted look over there wide awake it's cloudy i believe they've had rain over yonder hurrah shouted wide awake those are rain clouds sure enough we may have news to-night that there's been a downpour out back they rode back to the homestead and sure enough that night news was brought that there had been a heavy storm in the paddocks the water being up to a horse's shoulder in places several tanks were filled and two miles and a half of fencing washed away the water was running into the river having already come twenty-five miles in its course along the creeks good news indeed said ted bryce we shall be able to get feed and soon have our horses fat better than nothing said wide awake but i wish we could get a storm round here next morning ted bryce on looking out into the garden fancied there was a mist dancing before his eyes there was no wind and yet all the leaves seemed to move although the branches did not stir the fruit also appeared to move he rubbed his eyes and looked again this time the vegetables they were no longer green but all colours and strange to say the same restless movement was noticeable on them he went into the garden and soon discovered the cause of this strange phenomenon thousands of ladybirds had invaded the garden a regular plague of them and they covered up every leaf and plant and were devouring everything green in the place it was these tiny insects moving about caused the peculiar scene that had surprised ted bryce there was no stopping this pest the ladybirds had taken possession and would not be dislodged it was disheartening and ted bryce commenced to think there was no luck about the place however he had like scores of other squatters to make the best of it and to read in the sydney papers how shameful it was that these station-holders were not more heavily taxed and made to disgorge some of their vast profits for the benefit of the community it made ted bryce wild to read the rash and outrageous assertions made by irresponsible men both in and out of parliament rolling in wealth are we he said to himself i shall lose seven or eight thousand here this year if i lose a penny hey ho a squatter's life just at present is not a happy one it's no use growling hello what's this he said as he turned the paper he was reading over the bryce mystery a clue at last this was what he read under the above heading at last the police have obtained evidence which we believe will place them on the track of the murderers of the late henry bryce of the well-known firm of bryce golding and company at present the investigation department is reticent but we are in a position to state that one of the suspected men is now in custody on another very serious charge it would be unfair to state definitely the name of this man although we are in possession of it as he will be tried for the other offence shortly and it might prejudice his case we can however state that this man was once in the san francisco police force and that he belonged to a gang of men in that city known as high flyers these men murdered several individuals in a similar manner to that in which the late mr bryce came by his death as a rule the men done to death by these high flyers in frisco were not robbed the gang of ruffians were employed by other men to get rid of certain citizens who stood in the way of men holding high positions in the city it may have been some such influence was at work in the case of the late mr bryce anyway 
the information in the possession of the police promises to lead up to some interesting developments. When Ted Bryce had finished reading the paragraph, he sent for Wide Awake. Read that, he said, handing him the paper and pointing out the paragraph. Wide Awake read it and handed the paper back. That means Eli Spence, said Ted Bryce. I reckon it does, said Wide Awake. That's Sergeant Tyler's doing. He got all I knew about Eli Spence out of me, but he did not tell me what it was for. But you guessed, said Ted. I had an idea. I knew Spence by sight in Frisco. Is what is stated here true if it refers to him? asked Ted. Yes, said Wide Awake. He was kicked out of the force for it. Lots of the shearers know all about it. That is what caused the row when I fought him in the shed. I gave a brief sketch of his career for the benefit of his mates. Do you think he had anything to do with the murder of my father? asked Ted Bryce. I won't go as far as that, but I know he was at your father's election meeting that night, said Wide Awake. How do you know that? asked Ted Bryce, now thoroughly roused. Because he let it out himself in the shed. It must be true. He did not invent it, said Wide Awake. Then I wonder who the scoundrel is that is at the back of him, said Ted. Eli Spence is not a man to stick at trifles. He would knock anyone on the head for a twenty-pound note or less if he thought it could be done without danger, said Wide Awake. It ought to be easy enough to get out of him who put him up to the cowardly outrage, said Ted. That is, if he really had a hand in it. I don't know so much about that, said Wide Awake. I have known cases where the murderer actually accepted money from a man thoroughly disguised, and no attempt was made to learn the name of the man who gave the bribe. But surely the taker of the bribe would endeavour to learn who had bribed him. They generally extort money and blackmail them after it's all over, said Ted. It has not been so in this case, if Eli Spence is the man, said Wide Awake, or he would not have been here shearing. He was hard up. That is why he came here. Now, depend upon it, if Eli Spence did the deed, he does not know the man who urged him on to it. These villains who bribe men to commit crimes have a way of shielding themselves, even from the man or men they employ. Eli Spence may be guilty, said Ted Bryce, but as I told Sergeant Tyler, I doubt it. For the life of me, I cannot see what Spence's motive could be. The motive would be ten or twenty pounds, perhaps more, said Wide Awake. Spence would murder a man every week, if he dare, for that amount. Is it possible, said Ted Bryce, in the case of such a man as Eli Spence, yes, said Wide Awake. What's that? said Ted Bryce. A sound like small lumps of soft earth rolled into balls the size of marbles was heard at intervals, falling on the roof. Raindrops, said Wide Awake. They were so excited they both forgot all about Eli Spence and his alleged misdeeds and sprang up and made for the garden. Sure enough, the storm was coming, and raindrops that left a splash the size of a penny piece were dropping on the wooden steps leading on to the veranda. In a few moments, the drops came down in a torrent, and in five minutes it was raining as though a second deluge had commenced. End of chapter 18《ハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデーハッピーバースデー From what her brother had told her, she surmised that her stepmother was either engaged to Herbert Golding, or had gone so far as to promise to marry him when a sufficient time had elapsed since Henry Bryce's death. Mrs. Bryce thought the best policy she could pursue was to leave Ida to her own devices, and she knew the girl was to be trusted. There was a sturdy independence about Ida Bryce, which made her stepmother rather afraid of her, she would not have Ida know of her engagement to Herbert Golding for worlds. She knew she would not spare her if she found out the truth. 
so ida bryce did as she pleased and mrs bryce kept her own counsel and did not interfere with her wyndham hanworth commenced to paint the portrait of herbert golding who from his own choice came to the artist's studio for that purpose there was something about herbert golding that interested the artist wyndham hanworth could not help thinking as he painted herbert golding's portrait what lay behind his subject's impenetrable countenance he became thoroughly interested in his work but as the painting progressed it did not satisfy him it was like herbert golding and yet unlike him at times the artist thought it an excellent portrait and at other times he felt inclined to put his fist through the canvas and commence the work again herbert golding seemed pleased with the work and yet when he looked at it wyndham hanworth saw a peculiar expression on his face as though he was surprised and half afraid peculiar man herbert golding said wyndham to his sister i cannot make him out at all he appears to me to be a man with a secret troubling him and i believe he actually thinks i am of that opinion and am painting him accordingly i cannot help the expression on his face i am afraid the portrait will not be a great success flora i wish i could throw up the task and finish off the shearing picture it would be more congenial work do you like herbert golding asked flora can't say i do replied her brother the more i study him the less i like him i am afraid this is what hinders me in my work if i liked the man i could put more heart into my work as it is i feel disposed to burn the portrait sometimes it must be an uncongenial occupation painting a man's portrait and at the same time having a distinct dislike to him said flora that's it exactly he replied but the worst of it is i have no particular reason to dislike him the feeling grows upon me the more i see of him ida bryce dislikes him said flora and i have noticed of late win that your likes and ida's have a great similarity nonsense said her brother what has that got to do with it a good deal more than you imagine said flora are you very fond of ida win he hesitated a moment and then said yes i am i am afraid i am more than fond of her but i cannot say she gives me any encouragement you don't know ida said his sister if she loved you ever so much she would not show it until she was perfectly sure you were in love with her i am afraid there is not much chance for me in that quarter sighed wyndham you see she is an heiress and i am a struggling artist ida bryce is the sort of girl to make a brilliant match ida will never marry a man she does not love said flora you have a better chance with her than any one ida thinks nothing of money you need not let that trouble you sometimes at munda i fancied she liked me a little said her brother of course she does said flora who could help it she added with a glance of pride at him because you consider me passable as a brother said wyndham it does not follow ida bryce cares a straw about me we shall see said his sister i rather fancy ida cares several bundles of straw about you you only want to set one or two of the straws on fire and there will be a regular blaze of love for you upon my word you are improving said her brother you are quite smart your visit to munda has done you a lot of good it has said flora smiling her brother looked at her curiously and then said are you fond of edward bryce flora yes she replied with a bright smile very you sly minx said her brother i believe he has proposed to you he has said flora good gracious when he exclaimed the day we left for sydney he nearly did it in the night of the attack she said i am very glad to hear it said wyndham ted bryce is a real good fellow tell me all about it there's not much to tell she said i think we were in love with each other long ago the night those men attacked the homestead you remember i attended to ted and ida looked after you well when he was on the sofa in a kind of half faint he he out with it flora said her brother he kissed me said flora wonderful said wyndham courageous youth i should as soon think of jumping over the moon or trying to as attempting to kiss ida bryce 
there you are wrong said flora we girls like to be taken by storm it is the sudden attack that is irresistible a girl likes a lover to be masterful that's a wrinkle said wyndham i am afraid if i attempted to take such a liberty with ida bryce she would never speak to me again catch her in the right mood and try her said flora but where did ted ask you to be his wife said wyndham at the railway station said flora how unromantic laughed wyndham yes wasn't it said flora we were just going to get into the train and ted said flora tell me you love me before you leave tell me you will be my wife it was rather sudden but i expected it and said yes to both his questions that was all he would have sealed the compact with another kiss had it been possible and you never told me said wyndham i thought it best for ted to speak first but as you asked me i have told you all said flora i congratulate you i could not wish my sister to marry a better man she came to him and kissed him and said fondly i hope before long ida will really be my sister he shook his head but made no reply he had his doubts about being successful with ida bryce herbert golding's portrait was approaching completion and wyndham hanworth seemed to hold back from putting the finishing touches to the face ida bryce's remarks about painting a man's face so that he should see the expression of his own hidden thoughts in it often occurred to him one morning after an hour's sitting herbert golding said you seem to have some difficulty in giving the proper expression to the face i do not think i often look like that mr hanworth i have not finished it off said the artist i think you will be pleased with it when it is finished the expression ought to be more pleasing said herbert golding wyndham hanworth looked at the portrait and said it is a good likeness as you have sat for it mr golding the face often gives expression to the thoughts and perhaps your thoughts have not always been pleasant when you have been sitting herbert golding started and looked hard at wyndham hanworth then a thought seemed to strike him and he said how do you know what i am thinking about when i sit to you i did not say i knew what you were thinking about mr golding the artist replied i merely said that from the expression of your face it was probable your thoughts had not always been pleasant then you should have asked me to look more cheerful said herbert golding and if i had asked you to try and look cheerful when you did not feel so your picture would have been unnatural said wyndham there is a vast difference between painting a forced expression and a real one i don't see that replied mr golding a photographer often asks you to look more pleasing when you sit to have a photo taken i am not a photographer said wyndham hanworth i am an artist and i like to paint as true to nature as my abilities allow if you do not care for the portrait mr golding i am quite willing for another artist to undertake the commission there is no occasion for that said herbert golding your abilities are too well known to be questioned mr hanworth i merely suggested that i did not think i was such a glum-looking personage wyndham hanworth looked at the picture and said you are right mr golding the expression is rather gloomy i think however i can make it more pleasing if it would suit you better but you must bring pleasant thoughts with you the next time you sit herbert golding left the studio somewhat ill at ease he wondered if it could be true that the portrait was a reflection of his thoughts he knew those thoughts had at times been of anything but a pleasant nature he determined at the next sitting he would look on the bright side of things and not dwell upon matters calculated to make him look gloomy wyndham hanworth sat down before the portrait when herbert golding left him and examined it intently you are a bad lot i am afraid he said to himself addressing the picture i have tried hard to make you look pleasant but it's no go there's something behind that face i can't fathom it is no business of mine but i wish you had a clearer conscience herbert golding if you had it would come out in your expression confound the thing he looks as though he had committed a crime and was hourly afraid of being taxed with it that will never do in a presentation portrait i'll try again it won't take me long to copy what i want of this portrait i'll give him a new head and try and put a clear conscience into it 
i never was so stuck up before i wish to goodness someone else had the work next time herbert golding called wyndham hanworth said i'm going to put a new head on to you mr golding so try and have pleasant thoughts in it a new head what do you mean he asked i mean i am determined to give you a chance to look pleasant replied the artist i will paint a fresh portrait it will not take me long thank you very much mr hanworth said herbert golding i should be sorry for my friends to think i always looked so gloomy i hope it will not give you very much trouble an artist should never think any trouble too great to make his work good said wyndham and you will destroy the other painting said herbert golding somewhat anxiously wyndham hanworth looked at him in surprise probably he said at present i want to see how the portraits compare and to note the difference in the expression when i have done that i certainly see no use in keeping the other picture he's afraid of that portrait thought wyndham hanworth when herbert golding had left i've a good mind to finish it off and give him a fright i believe ida bryce was right and herbert golding saw his own thoughts reflected in the face i painted i caught one expression that startled me it was only a brief flash across his face but i never saw a greater look of apprehension almost terror in a man's eyes before i'll do it now while it is vividly before me wyndham hanworth took the portrait of herbert golding and commenced to work upon the face End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain signs of the times signs were not wanting that before long there would be a financial crisis in the colony there had been several heavy failures money was tight and a feeling of apprehension in business circles prevailed when a crisis of this description is at hand it is generally foreshadowed by failures most of them unexpected herbert golding was uneasy at the turn affairs had taken and the amalgamated land and investment company had not improved its position of late in fact things were going from bad to worse in that quarter dr langside was somewhat surprised when the thirty thousand pounds advanced by henry bryce to the company was refunded he had a shrewd idea where the money came from but he kept his opinion to himself he was satisfied to know the money was safe the squatters had not had a good season and there had been heavy withdrawals from the banks how the run commenced no one exactly knew rumours quickly circulate people talk these matters over and as the statements pass from mouth to mouth they become enlarged and exaggerated at first the banks were well able to meet the demands for gold made upon them but the managers could not help seeing if the withdrawals continued the position would be serious at least one bank closed its doors and then ensued a panic such as sydney had never witnessed before all the banks were rushed and the drain upon their resources was tremendous every morning the papers gave news that startled the public and bank after bank suspended business until only such old establishments as the bank of new south wales the union bank the bank of australasia the city bank and one or two more held out a senseless rush was made upon the savings bank of new south wales and crowds of depositors stood outside the doors fighting and struggling to gain admission in order to withdraw their accounts many persons who succeeded in reaching the counters and obtaining their money were robbed of it in the crowd outside and the pickpockets reaped a rich harvest the safe deposit company was resorted to and thousands of pounds worth of sovereigns were withdrawn from circulation and locked up in this place even the post office savings bank was not exempted from the general run and thousands of pounds were withdrawn by the frightened depositors of course these banks were perfectly safe but in times of panic people do not consider what they are doing but follow the lead given like a flock of sheep passing down george street one morning 
Wyndham Hanworth saw a tremendous crowd of people blocking up the roadway in front of a well-known bank. He understood what had happened, and quietly observed the scene. It was a curious crowd, composed of all kinds of people, but he judged the main portion of them were small depositors, eager to withdraw what little they had to their credit. Those who had money on fixed deposit, he knew, stood but little chance of withdrawing, and there were many such people in the crowd. He noted the varying expression on the faces of this struggling mass of people. The bare idea of losing their money had transformed many of them. People that at ordinary times were quiet and unobtrusive, were rushing about with white faces and wild eager eyes, asking senseless questions, and badgering everyone they met for information. Some men with notes on this particular bank were selling them at a considerable loss to men more far-seeing than themselves, who were eager to make this panic profitable to themselves. Pound notes changed hands for seventeen shillings and less, and one individual actually offered Wyndham Hanworth ten one-pound notes for five sovereigns. Madness seemed to have settled upon the people and altered them beyond recognition. The panic lasted for several days, and the government had to step in, in order to allay the fears of the public, and put a stop, if possible, to this run on the banks that still remained open. The locking up of so much gold caused great inconvenience, and the resources of the sound banks were taxed to the utmost. A lull came after the storm, but the excitement did not abate for a long time. It was quite evident that the bulk of the banks would have to reconstruct, and this not always on favourable terms to the depositors. Men began to grumble about the big dividends to shareholders some of these banks had been paying, 25%, and some went so far as to say these dividends had been paid out of fixed deposits. Enormous sums had been recklessly lent upon securities that had greatly depreciated in value. Wyndham Hanworth was told of one case in which a bank had advanced a hundred thousand pounds on an estate that was not at that time worth half the amount. There were scores of similar cases. Squatters had borrowed money on wool in the expectation of a big clip, and when their sheep died by the thousands, they found the number of bales fell far short of what they had reckoned upon, and consequently they were in a hole. Bank directors had a lively time of it during this crisis. No words were too strong for people to use against them, and accusations, wildly improbable, were brought forward. One director was accused of persuading all his to place money on fixed deposit in the bank, when he knew it was not in a sound financial condition. He was even accused of having forced men who were in his power to bank money in the institution of which he was a director. Many people were brought to the verge of ruin. It was maddening to them to think that they had an ample sum on fixed deposit in a bank, and yet had no earthly chance of drawing it out, or even of negotiating a loan upon it. But as the public excitement waned, many people did very foolish things. Some sold their deposits at a great loss, others secured small advances upon them at ruinous interest. Moneylenders saw their opportunity and stepped in. They lent with a sparing hand to supply present needs and raked in securities of great value. These men knew that it was only a question of time before they would be able to realise a tremendous profit. They anticipated the schemes of reconstruction the banks would adopt, and worked upon this foundation. Enterprising shopkeepers placed notices in their windows, stating that full value in goods would be given in exchange for one-pound notes on such and such a bank. Hundreds of people were induced to purchase goods they could have done without, in order to obtain full value in kind for paper they feared might become worthless. It was only when the government stepped in and made these notes a legal tender that people commenced to see their folly. The banks that had not closed accepted the notes of the banks that had suspended for reconstruction purposes. The savings banks accepted them as deposits at their full value. And then, the far-seeing man who had bought notes at a profit 
commenced to reap the benefit naturally this crisis in the legitimate banking institutions which was unavoidable came like a thunderclap on scores of shady investment and banking companies of the amalgamated land and investment company order herbert golding was in a peculiar position he foresaw what this crisis would lead to and yet he was not in a financial condition to take advantage of it inwardly he cursed himself as much as such an outwardly pious individual could do for handing over mrs bryce's thirty thousand with that amount of money at his command he felt he could have doubled it during the crisis and realised long before it became necessary to fulfil his promise to dr langside the amalgamated land company he knew could not hold out much longer he was quite aware the company had not been sound for two or three years as he sat in church apparently devoutly attending to the sermon of his vicar he was meditating upon the course he ought to take in order to ensure his own safety he abhorred flight he knew he could lay his hands on several thousands but he dreaded the exposure although he was a hypocrite he did not wish the world to know it he had a very good opinion of the world's opinion the vicar was expatiating in his mild way upon the results of the recent crisis and trusted it would be a lesson to his congregation not to place too much value upon worldly possessions but to look to higher things when the discourse was over he was very anxious to hear from herbert golding how the amalgamated land company's finances were and whether his own fixed deposit was safe henry golding satisfied him by saying it was a great advertisement for the company's stability that the present crisis had not affected them at all strange to say however when the term upon which a fixed deposit had been placed in the amalgamated land company expired the money was speedily withdrawn herbert golding knew there would soon come a time when there would be no ready cash to meet these withdrawals he wondered whether the bank would be allowed to formulate a scheme of reconstruction he rather fancied not because there was nothing sound about its present construction upon which to reconstruct when money paid into a bank is deliberately divided among the directors and the few shareholders in the shape of profits and there are no substantial assets to meet liabilities then herbert's golding knew as well as any man fraud was the word to use in connection with that bank mrs bryce had been uneasy about her money and had plagued herbert golding with questions innumerable which he had answered to the best of his ability and his powers of evasion if mrs bryce had not been in love with him she would probably have acted like a sensible woman and disbelieved his fairy tales she was however blindly prejudiced in his favour and he carefully guided that prejudice into a channel favourable to the company. Wyndham Hanworth found it a difficult matter to fix Herbert Golding's attention when he sat for his portrait, but he succeeded in a fashion. The new picture pleased Herbert Golding, but it did not please Wyndham Hanworth. The artist felt it was a flattering portrait, and Herbert Golding was about the last man he cared to flatter. He could not bear to look at the new portrait alone, so he placed the two side by side. Undoubtedly the first painting was the better likeness, but it did not represent Herbert Golding in a favourable light. The more desirous Herbert Golding was that the first portrait should be destroyed, the more determined the artist was that he would keep it to suit his own convenience. He liked to look at this picture of Herbert Golding, now that he had put that look into the eyes since these finishing touches herbert golding had not seen it he would have liked it less than he did before it turned out however that the first painting was to prove more important to herbert golding's career than the second End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Colt by Phantom. 
Sam Fraser had been chaffed considerably by the Randwick trainers when he returned to Sydney. He was asked if he had been out west on a fleecing expedition, and if he had been shearing any guileless young men in that locality. Sam took their bantering in good part, and as he was fairly popular, he was soon left alone to continue his work in peace. The colt by Phantom was now three years old, and had shown such remarkable staying powers on the track, that the trainer fancied he would have a good chance in the Sydney Cup, with the light weight he was sure to get. Being out of a mare called Fright, Ted Bryce named him the Ghost, which was appropriate. Sam Fraser made no secret of his opinion of the colt. As Ted Bryce was not a betting owner, it mattered very little to him who knew the merits of the horse. He came up from Munda soon after Wyndham Hanworth had finished the second portrait of Herbert Golding. His engagement to the artist's sister was generally known, and Mrs. Bryce told Herbert Golding that Flora was a schemer and that she knew quite well why she was anxious to go to Munda with Ida. "'I should not be at all surprised if Ida accepted Mr. Hanworth,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'Anyone can see he is over head and ears in love with her.' It was perfectly correct that Wyndham Hanworth was in love with Ida Bryce, but she gave him very little encouragement. Sam Fraser was anxious Edward Bryce should see the ghost gallop, and Ted agreed to drive to the course and take Wyndham Hanworth with him. "'I know very little about horses,' said the artist, "'but I love a drive in the early morning, "'and if I shan't be in the way, I'll go with you, Ted.' About half-past six they were in a hansom, driving to the course, and went through the Centennial Park. It was a charming morning, nice and cool and a fresh breeze blowing. They could see numerous horses filing onto the course as they drove through the gates onto the Randwick Road. Sam Fraser had borrowed a horse to gallop with the ghost, as the pair he had brought down from Munda were not fast enough. It was evident to Ted Bryce, as soon as he saw the ghost, that the colt had made a vast improvement since he had been brought from Munda. "'That's a remarkably nice colt of yours, Mr Bryce,' said William Sellers, a well-known owner of racehorses, as the ghost walked onto the track. "'How's he bred?' "'He's by a horse we call the Phantom,' said Ted, "'out of a Yettendon mare called Fright. "'How the Phantom is bred is more than I can tell. "'He's a wild horse. "'We've never been able to catch him, "'although I can assure you we've had some great rides after him.' "'I've heard about that horse,' said Mr Sellers. "'Curious thing, isn't it? "'He must be a good bred one to get a colt like that.' "'Yes, I'm sure he's well-bred,' said Ted, "'and he's the best galloper I ever saw.' Then the conversation changed, and Sellers said, "'I suppose these banks have hit you a bit, "'the same as the rest of us, Mr Bryce.' "'Yes,' replied Ted, "'but luckily it will not inconvenience me. "'I've got some money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company,' "'said William Sellers, "'and I'm anxious to draw it out. "'I gave notice I should withdraw when the twelve months was up and I'm getting anxious about it. The money ought to have been paid a week ago. Mr. Golding, your partner, is the chairman of directors. I thought perhaps you might know how matters stood there, and whether they had been affected by the crisis. Ted Bryce had been asked several times since his return to Sydney if he knew anything about the affairs of the amalgamated company, and he was annoyed at the persistent requests for information. He knew, however, that Mr. Sellers was not a man to question him, merely out of curiosity, and, moreover, he liked William Sellers, who had often given him good advice about horses. "'I've been asked several times if I knew how the amalgamated company stands,' said Ted Bryce. "'I know nothing whatever about the bank. Mr. Golding ought to know what he is about. I should hardly think he would hold the position he does if he was not quite certain of the company's stability. As you are an old friend, Mr. Sellers, I may tell you in confidence that my father, according to Herbert Golding's statement, advanced the company £30,000. That amount was repaid not a long ago. It may have been a drain upon the resources of the company, but I should think it is sound. Thank you, Mr. Bryce, said Sellers. I have a couple of thousand in the amalgamated, and I don't care to lose it. If Mr. Hamworth does not mind, may I speak a word to you privately for a moment? By all means, said Wyndham, as he moved away and spoke to Sam Fraser, 
who was standing near watching the ghost and his mate walk down towards the sheds where they were to start for a two miles gallop there's something i've heard i think you ought to know mr bryce said sellers i can't tell you where i received the information from but i know it's correct don't tell me anything you do not feel it is right for you to disclose said ted under the circumstances i think i am perfectly justified in telling you said mr sellers i knew your father well and i've known you for some years are you aware that your stepmother deposited thirty thousand pounds in the amalgamated i am said ted i strongly advised her not to do it you did right said mr sellers i know for an absolute fact that the thirty thousand paid into the amalgamated by mrs bryce was used to pay back the same amount herbert golding got from your father ted bryce had half suspected this but it surprised him to hear it from mr sellers are you certain about this he asked it is a serious matter i am positive said mr sellers ask golding and see how he takes it there is another thing i should like to tell you mr bryce i do not believe your father ever advanced that money but surely you do not suggest that herbert golding did it on his own responsibility said ted bryce surprised that is precisely what i do mean said mr sellers and i also believe your father found him out ted bryce looked startled when do you think he found him out he asked i was one of your father's committee when he put up for balmain east said mr sellers he gave me a hint about it himself he advised me not to put any money in the amalgamated but i had done it then from what he said to me i felt certain had he lived herbert golding would not now be a partner nor would he have been an executor if your father could have altered his will this is most extraordinary mr sellers you ought to have given me this information before said ted so i should have done but i have been away in new zealand i only returned the day before yesterday in order to lose no time i thought i would tell you at once although it is hardly the place for it said mr sellers with a smile it is very strange my father should be put out of the way so soon after his partner made this discovery said ted it has proved a fortunate thing for herbert golding said mr sellers but mind you mr bryce i do not think he is the man to have had a hand in your father's death it is a curious coincidence that is all i shall make further inquiries about this affair said ted bryce i am much obliged to you for giving me the information if anything fresh transpires i will call upon you that is all i have to say mr bryce i hope it will not spoil your morning's pleasure but i thought it better to tell you as early as possible said mr sellers no you have not spoilt the morning's pleasure you have given a zest to it said ted bryce i have sworn to avenge my poor father's death and there shall be a day of reckoning for the man who caused it when i find him william sellers looked at ted bryce's face and thought he would not care to be in that man's shoes when edward bryce discovered him sam fraser shouted they're off mr bryce and he pointed to a couple of horses rounding the bend at full gallop and they were quickly in the straight it's the ghost and la belle said mr sellers the mare belongs to me then i'm much obliged to you for lending her to fraser to gallop with my colt said ted the obligation is on my side said william sellers from what my trainer says the ghost should give me a very good line as to the merits of my mare he gallops just like the old phantom said ted bryce you ought to pay me a visit at munda mr sellers and then you might get a glimpse of the horse i should very much like to said william sellers mind i do not take you at your word and suddenly make a raid upon you you'll have a hearty welcome whenever you come said ted the ghost and la belle were going along the back stretch at a great pace and the gallop was evidently going to be a good one the usual crowd of men on the track had their watches out timing the go and sam fraser kept glancing at his chronometer to see how the pace was those last two furlongs were got over in fast time he said to ted bryce it will be a real good gallop la belle was a five-year-old and as she carried a light boy sam fraser expected her to beat the colt comfortably the ghost however did not mean to be left behind at the ledger stand the mare led him by a length but the lad on the ghost shook the whip at the colt and he soon drew level again it was a ding-dong finish and as they passed the post 
La Belle was only about half a length to the good. "'By Jove, that colt's a clinker,' said Mr. Sellers. "'I congratulate you on having such a good one.' "'Is your mare reliable?' said Ted. "'It looks almost too good a performance for the colt, considering the race's La Belle's won. "'I can assure you there's not a more reliable track horse at Randwick than my mare,' said William Sellers. "'In that case, the ghost is much better than I ever thought him,' said Ted Bryce. Sam Fraser was delighted with the gallop, and the ghost walked into the yards as cool and fresh as though he had only been out for ordinary exercise. "'You ought not to get more than six stone ten pound or seven stone at the very outside on that colt in the Sydney Cup,' said Mr. Sellers. "'And what do you expect the mare to get?' asked Ted. "'About eight stone,' said Mr. Sellers. "'Then on this morning's gallop I ought to have a chance, if the ghost is not overweighted.' said ted yes a chance second to none said mr sellers if i hear anything more about the amalgamated i'll let you know said ted bryce to mr sellers as he and wyndham hanworth got into the hansom call and see me replied mr sellers very well replied ted as they started for sydney as they drove to town ted bryce related to wyndham most of the conversation he had had with mr sellers Wyndham Hanworth thought for a few moments, and then said, "'You have not seen the portraits I painted of Herbert Golding, Ted. Come up to the studio and have a look at them this afternoon.' "'Portraits?' said Ted. "'Have you painted more than one?' "'I painted two. Herbert Golding did not like the first. He said it was too gloomy-looking. I am very anxious to have your opinion, more especially after what you have told me,' said Wyndham. "'What difference can it make to my opinion of a portrait?' said ted bryce wait until you see it said wyndham and then you will understand what i mean end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain in the studio well here i am said Ted Bryce as he entered Wyndham Hanworth's studio, bearding the lion in his den. "'I'm afraid I'm not much of a lion,' said Wyndham. "'At all events, not a roaring lion, for I have not created much noise in the world.' "'What nonsense,' said Ted Bryce. "'Look here, Wyn, it's about time you gave up this constant running down of your work. Other people praise it. Why cannot you be satisfied with it?' "'Because whatever other people may say or think,' said Wyndham, I know it is not good work I've been turning out lately. I'm a bit unsettled, Ted. That's the true cause of it. Whatever have you got to unsettle you? said Ted Bryce. The artistic temperament accounts for it, probably. That is generally unsettled and uncertain, I believe. No, it is nothing to do with art in this instance, said Wyndham Hamworth. But it has a lot to do with nature, in the shape of a lovely woman. Oh, that's it, exclaimed Ted Bryce. I grant you, a charming girl is a disturbing element in a man's life, more especially when he has not put the desperate question to her. Surely you've not been refused, Wynne? Oh, no, I've not had the pluck to risk a refusal. I would rather exist in a blissful state of uncertainty than know there was no hope, said Wyndham. I managed to screw up courage to ask Flora, said Ted Bryce. Come, old fellow, if that is all that's hindering your work, ask her at once. "'Anyone can see you're in love with her.' "'Why, you don't even know who the lady is,' said Wyndham. "'But how can you know I'm in love with any particular girl?' "'Bet you I know her name,' said Ted Bryce. "'I have it in one guess. "'Front name, Ida. "'Surname, same as my own. "'I see, I've hit the mark. "'Take her, win, and may you be happy.' "'Do you think I have any chance with her?' said Wyndham. "'It's an absolute certainty that I shall be refused,' he said. "'Accepted,' said Ted Bryce. "'I wish I could think so,' the artist said. "'You don't know Ida yet,' said her brother. "'She's not demonstrative, but she is a real good girl and has deep feelings. "'I know she likes you, and Ida's liking is what a more impulsive girl would call love.' "'You give me hope,' said Wyndham. "'But consider our positions. "'I have nothing to give your sister, and she is rich. "'It would be called a mercenary match on my part.' "'as I have no doubt it has been on Flora's side. 
i'd like to hear any man say flora was marrying me for my money said ted bryce he would stand a very good chance of being knocked down you say you have nothing to give ida i say you have the name of hanworth is already known to fame with ida's assistance and i'm not such a fool as to deny money is useful in such cases you will become a great artist you'll be able to devote your time to your work and also be able to paint what you like it's the struggling artist has to paint to order not the man who is famous or who has ample means you know that is true because you would not have painted herbert golding had such not been the case it has not been a labour of love painting that man's portrait said wyndham hanworth i am glad to hear you speak like this ted i was half afraid you might object to me as not being good enough for your sister then you wronged me said ted you are my best friend win and i know ida would be happy with you i'll chance it said wyndham but if your sister declines me with thanks it will be no more than i deserve ted bryce was not of this opinion and said so but where are the portraits of herbert golding he asked wyndham hanworth stepped to an easel upon which a picture rested and throwing off the cover disclosed the second portrait he had painted of herbert golding that's like him said ted bryce but it flatters him is this the second portrait yes said wyndham he did not like the first he would like it still less now i have put an expression into his eyes that i caught in them for a brief moment i confess the look startled me how said ted bryce what sort of a look was it you can judge for yourself said wyndham hanworth i will show you the portrait i am anxious to hear if your opinion coincides with my own he drew the covering off the next easel and edward bryce started back when he saw the picture good heavens win this must be imagination on your part herbert golding never had that look on his face surely i thought it would surprise you said the artist i assure you the expression is not exaggerated it is toned down softened if anything what do you think of it any one looking at that face can only surmise one thing said ted bryce and that is asked the artist that the man was terrified by his thoughts when he sat for the portrait i see it all now said ted bryce excitedly your opinion coincides exactly with mine said wyndham his thoughts were reflected in his face and i surprised them there it surprised him too when he saw it and that was before i had touched the eyes up but what are you so excited about ted don't you see cannot you guess said ted bryce you say his thoughts were reflected in his face as you painted him i believe you and i believe herbert golding was thinking about how my father met his death as he sat for that portrait i never saw such a look of absolute dread in a man's face before i am on the track at last win if that man did not murder my father he knew all about it he may not have struck the blow but he had a hand in my father's death i'll swear look at the face only a guilty man could look like that and his crime must have been an awful one you caught herbert golding in his true colours in that portrait it reveals the man as he is it's simply wonderful i must let sergeant tyler see it and hear what he has to say do nothing rash ted said the artist i knew what you would think when you saw the picture that is why i said what i did in the cab this morning but be careful you have a dangerous man to deal with i am certain and he may not be guilty after all you cannot look on that face and say herbert golding has a clear conscience said ted bryce i grant you that said wyndham but it may not be your father's death that troubles him it may be money matters affairs connected with the amalgamated or other matters we know nothing of it may be as you say said ted bryce that we must find out i must think of some plan you say he has not seen the portrait since you altered the eyes under those circumstances it will be a shock for him when he does see it i should like to be present when he looks at it and also have tyler here we could easily be concealed in this room i'll trap him so sure as he is alive that portrait will be the ruin of herbert golding they talked the matter over for some time and finally ted bryce left saying he would arrange for everything connected with herbert golding seeing the portrait <laughs> 
when edward bryce and dr langside went through the books of the firm of bryce golding and company with a chartered accountant to assist them it was soon evident that herbert golding had been helping himself freely herbert golding it must be understood had put no money into the firm when henry bryce took him into it he had been engaged in henry bryce's business for many years and had made himself thoroughly master of the concern it was this that induced henry bryce to give him an interest in the business but it had only been a minor position and henry bryce was the real firm of bryce golding and company herbert golding's position in the firm was clearly defined in henry bryce's papers since henry bryce's death with the consent of edward bryce herbert golding had been entrusted with much greater powers he had used his power to the full and from the books it was gathered he had drained the resources of the firm considerably it was the opinion of the accountant that herbert golding could be criminally prosecuted for what he had done when ted bryce and dr langside came to talk the matter over ted said he has not spent all the money he's not the man to do that he has a hoard put away somewhere and he must be made to disgorge it by the by doctor have you seen the portraits of herbert golding that mr hanworth has painted asked ted no said dr langside then i should like you to see them said ted bryce and tell me what your opinion is of the first portrait he painted i will call round at the studio and look at them said dr langside in the meantime what shall you do about the books leave that to me said ted bryce i will promise you herbert golding will be out of the firm in a week and that if he has the money safe he shall give it up you'll be clever if you can manage all that in a week said dr langside i have a tight screw i can put on him said ted bryce then screw it down without any mercy said dr langside that man is a bad lot i know he is said ted bryce get him out of the firm as speedily as possible said dr langside because the amalgamated land company is sure to smash up before long and if he was in the firm it might complicate matters i'll see to that said ted are you perfectly certain about the amalgamated yes said dr langside i cannot tell you how i am certain but you may take it for granted and does golding know the company is insolvent asked ted bryce he does said dr langside and he has known for some time what a scoundrel the man is said ted bryce he is one of the biggest hypocrites i know said dr langside and of all men i hate a hypocrite what a surprise it will be for the goody goody people when the crash comes said ted bryce it will said dr langside religion in this case covers a multitude of sins don't forget to call and see those portraits said ted bryce i will look in as i go home said dr langside he did look into Wyndham Hanworth's studio, and when he saw the first portrait of Herbert Golding, he was as surprised as Edward Bryce had been, although he did not show it so openly. "'That is the face of a man with a heavy burden on his conscience,' said Dr. Langside. "'Do you know, Mr. Hanworth, that the painting is an exceedingly clever one?' "'I am glad you think so,' said Wyndham, "'because Mr. Golding did not like it.' "'I don't wonder at it,' said Dr. Langside, laughing. You must have caught the expression very accurately. I did, said Wyndham. I was amazed at the look of terror in the eyes. You see it in the portrait, do you not, Doctor? Quite plainly. I never saw a painting of a man's mind before, but I am certain Herbert Golding's thoughts are painted on that face. It is the face of a man who has forgotten for the time where he is, and has let his thoughts master him. When you caught that expression, Herbert Golding was utterly oblivious of the fact that he was in your studio, and that you were painting his portrait. He was, I should think, startled when he saw it, said Dr. Langside. He has not seen it as it is, said Wyndham Hanworth. I have put that expression in the eyes since he saw it last. Then I should show it to him now, said Dr. Langside. I intend to, said Wyndham. It will teach him a lesson he will never forget, said Dr. Langside. He will see his thoughts reflected in his face, and it will teach him the truth of the saying, that a guilty conscience needs no accuser. End of chapter 22
Chapter Twenty Three of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Face to Face. Herbert Golding expressed great surprise when Edward Bryce said they must dissolve partnership. He was not aware that a thorough examination of the books had been made. When he heard the reasons given by Edward Bryce for wishing to dissolve the partnership, he was exceedingly angry and indignant. "'It's of no use your protesting in this manner,' said Ted Bryce. "'A thorough overhauling of the books has been made, and that ought to be sufficient to prove to you that you can no longer remain in the firm. You may think yourself lucky if you're not criminally prosecuted. I've not made my mind up what course to take at present, but if you do not at once retire from the firm, I shall know how to act. I shall not consent to a dissolution of partnership without it is made worth my while, said Herbert Golding. I may as well tell you, said Ted Bryce, taking no notice of his remarks, that I do not believe my father ever advanced you thirty thousand pounds for the amalgamated land company. I go further and say he did not. You paid that money back with the thirty thousand Mrs. Bryce, at your instigation, put into the bank on fixed deposit. You see, I know a good deal about your transactions. Perhaps you are aware I'm engaged to be married to Mrs. Bryce, sneered Herbert Golding. My sister guessed as much, but I was loath to believe it, said Ted Bryce. I thought Mrs. Bryce had more respect for herself and for my father's memory. It was with difficulty Herbert Golding controlled his temper. He did so by a great effort, knowing he was in an awkward fix. At the same time, he had an inward feeling of satisfaction that he had taken the precaution to safely dispose of a considerable sum of money, which he could put his hands on at short notice. "'Mrs. Bryce has a better opinion of me than you have,' he said. "'I'm sorry for her judgment,' said Ted Bryce. "'I must also inform you that the money you have taken must be refunded.' "'I have not drawn more out of the business than I was entitled to,' said Herbert Golding angrily, "'and I have no money to refund.' "'You have falsified the books,' said Ted Bryce. "'No doubt you have adopted similar means to bolster up the amalgamated land company. Perhaps it may be news to you to know that I am aware that the company is insolvent and that a crash cannot be long averted. Before the company smashes up, you must repay Mr. Sellers his deposit of two thousand pounds. If this is not done, I am afraid the crash will come sooner than you anticipate. Herbert Golding was cornered, and did not know how to act. He stood on the brink of something worse than ruin. "'Will you agree to my terms?' said Edward Bryce. "'What are they?' asked Herbert Golding. "'Dissolution of our partnership by mutual consent immediately. I have the form already legally drawn up. The refunding of the money you have unlawfully taken out of the firm the payment to Mr. Sellers of his two thousand. As to the thirty thousand you obtained from Mrs. Bryce, it is safe with me, and she will not suffer by your perfidy. You must also release Mrs. Bryce from her engagement. As to resigning your seat in the house, I leave that to your own discretion, and as for the amalgamated land company, it will come to grief without any interference on my part. If I accede to your unjust demands, it means ruin to me, said Herbert Golding. I have helped build up this business. Had it not been for my exertions, this firm would never have been in the position it is today. I think you owe me something on that score, Edward Bryce. I acknowledge your services in the past, said Edward Bryce, but I cannot overlook what you have done. On account of those services you allude to, I will not take any action against you if you agree to my terms. Will you sign the dissolution of partnership deed at once, so that it may be notified in the papers? When that notice is made public, said Herbert Golding, I shall have no chance to make a recovery. I have nothing to do with that, said Edward Bryce. Once and for all, will you agree to my terms? I will sign the document, said Herbert Golding. And about the refunding of the money, asked Ted Bryce. How much do you require? asked Herbert Golding. Roughly speaking, about nine or ten thousand pounds, said Edward Bryce. Herbert Golding laughed harshly. I have a few hundreds at the bank. You're welcome to that, he said. What have you done with the money? Sank it in the amalgamated, said Herbert Golding. Edward Bryce was inclined to believe him, 
he knew herbert golding had great faith in the company when it was formed and he thought he might have been tempted to take the money in order to bolster up the finances of the company as he looked at herbert golding he thought of the portrait he had seen at wyndham hanworth's and wondered if the man before him had any hand in his father's death he must wait and see how his plans developed at present he could not bring himself to believe that herbert golding actually committed the deed herbert golding saw ted bryce hesitated and said i assure you i am speaking the truth if the amalgamated turns out a failure i shall lose all my money we will waive the question of refunding the money said ted bryce but you must agree to all the other proposals and suppose mrs bryce refuses to release me from the engagement said herbert golding if you tell her everything said edward bryce and she still decides to marry you i shall not interfere but you must tell her the whole truth or i shall do so myself herbert golding had to give in the deed was duly signed and witnessed and the partnership dissolved and william sellers was agreeably surprised to receive his deposit of two thousand pounds with interest at ten per cent added by the way said ted bryce to herbert golding i have seen the portraits wyndham hanworth painted of you i should strongly advise you to get him to destroy the first one has he not done so said herbert golding it is scandalous he should keep such a thing in his studio i shall see him about it at once is he at home he'll be in to-morrow morning at eleven said ted bryce i am certain you will see him there at that hour if you take a note from me to him i am sure he will accede to my request and destroy the picture i should be obliged if you would give me a note to him said herbert golding you do not deserve it said ted bryce after all that has happened but i will give you the note as you desire it he wrote a note to the artist and handed it to herbert golding who said i will see him to-morrow at eleven herbert golding left the offices a beaten man he had been worsted by a man much younger than himself and he was anxious to know how it would all end as the partnership had been dissolved by mutual consent he could give out that he had received a large sum of money for his share in the business the bulk of which he meant to invest in the amalgamated company this he felt would be a politic stroke as it would uphold his own credit and also that of the company he was strangely anxious wyndham hanworth should destroy the first portrait he inwardly felt that it so to speak gave him away and exposed his faults and failings he was also anxious the presentation should be made without delay as it would increase his popularity sergeant tyler was in sydney for the trial of eli spence and his mates as the government had thought it wise to have them tried in sydney where a perfectly unbiased jury could be sworn edward bryce took sergeant tyler to wyndham hanworth's studio and he saw both portraits the whole circumstances were explained to him and his opinion of the first painting agreed with those of the artist and edward bryce that man's conscience gives him a lot of trouble said sergeant tyler i should very much like to see him when he looks at the picture it was agreed that sergeant tyler and edward bryce should be in the studio when herbert golding called and watch the effect the sight of the portrait had upon him accordingly they were there next morning and were concealed behind a curtain from which they could observe herbert golding without being seen by him punctually at eleven herbert golding called wyndham hanworth read the note edward bryce had written and which herbert golding handed to him you are very anxious to have the picture destroyed said the artist in a tone of annoyance since you last saw it i have made an alteration in the face perhaps you will like it better now i shall never like it said herbert golding i cannot bear it but will you look at it again asked wyndham if you wish it he replied stand here you will have a better light on it then he said herbert golding stood before the easel and sergeant tyler and edward bryce had a good view of his face wyndham hanworth pulled the covering off quickly and when herbert golding stood face to face with his own portrait he staggered back as though he had been struck a severe blow the colour went out of his face and his eyes were dilated with horror he seemed to have lost all power of speech 
in the portraits before him herbert golding saw himself as he really was and the sight appalled him his own face on the canvas seemed to accuse him of some terrible crime the eyes were fixed upon him and he gazed at them like a man fascinated it was some moments before he recovered himself then he looked at the artist with a pale frightened face and gasped take it away it's horrible i cannot bear the sight of it wyndham hanworth was not surprised at the effect the picture had on herbert's golding he handed him a chair and said sit down you look faint herbert golding dropped down into the chair looking cowed and miserable did i ever look like that he asked in a hollow voice yes said wyndham hanworth you looked like that when we were talking about the murder of henry bryce don't you recollect herbert golding trembled from head to foot i don't remember he gasped we never spoke of the murder of henry bryce you have a bad memory said wyndham hanworth you were thinking of henry bryce when that expression came into your face i know it said the artist fixing his eyes on the man cowering before him hush for god's sake said herbert golding you do not know what you are saying how could you know what i was thinking about look at your own face in that picture said the artist is not that enough to condemn you herbert golding recovered himself he rose from the chair and striding up to wyndham hanworth said i did not come here to be insulted why do you bring up henry bryce's murder now if i did think of it at the time you were painting my portrait no wonder i looked startled if we conversed about it i do not recollect the circumstances at all events as an artist you may have introduced a more pleasant subject i could guess your thoughts as i painted that picture said the artist i am afraid i cannot comply with your request and destroy it then i shall shouted herbert golding savagely as he raised his clenched hand and aimed a blow at the picture ted bryce saw his intention and darting from behind the curtain struck herbert golding's arm down before he had time to do the picture any damage when herbert golding saw who it was that had struck him he gave a sharp cry of fear you here he gasped yes i've heard and seen all said ted bryce played the spy said herbert golding and what may your object be in concealing yourself here to find out your true character herbert golding from what i have seen i have a shrewd suspicion you could tell me something about my father's death said edward bryce herbert golding again turned pale but he said angrily do you accuse me of having a hand in your father's death you had better take care what you say you may go too far i mean to go farther than i have done said ted bryce if you had a hand in my father's death herbert golding there will be a heavy day of reckoning between us you shall pay for this said herbert golding as he left the room anxious to get away as quickly as possible what do you think of him tyler said edward bryce as the constable stepped from behind the curtain he's a bad lot said tyler but i do not think he murdered your father he would have been more frightened had such been the case he may have had a hand in it but i don't think he's the man that struck the blow End of chapter 23「『Of Who Did It』by Nat Gould」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tried and Convicted The trial of Eli Spence and his mates took place at Darlinghurst before the Chief Justice of the Colony. It was regarded as an important case, and the Crown was anxious to secure a conviction. During the shearing season there had been several acts of incendiarism, and as the culprits had escaped each time the conviction of eli spence and the other men was eagerly sought for the prisoners had no grounds of defence they were caught red-handed at munda and edward bryce wyndham hanworth wide awake sergeant tyler and others testified to the men in the dock having committed the outrage there had been some difficulty about wide awake's evidence at first he had declined to give his real name 
but eventually he said he was known many years ago as joel chester when eli spence heard the name he was evidently surprised he looked as though he had heard it before to no other man present did wide awake's acknowledgments that his name was joel chester convey any meaning but eli spence recognized it wide awake looked straight at eli spence as he gave the name of joel chester and saw him start on behalf of the prisoners tom dow gave evidence he said what he could in their favour but it amounted to very little he had to acknowledge the men were not in the shearers camp at the time of the attack on munda mrs warden also gave evidence as to the prisoners being at the kangaroo and stated that she did not think they would have had time to reach munda she was severely cross-examined and before the legal gentleman had done with her she heartily wished she had never left the west to come to sydney the jury were not long in coming to a decision their verdict against all the prisoners after a quarter of an hour's consideration was one of guilty the chief justice in sentencing the men gave his opinion of the desperate nature of their crime which he said tended to alienate any sympathy that might exist for the shearers he pronounced eli spence to be a dangerous ruffian who would not stop at murder even to gain his own vile ends such a man was a standing menace to the maintenance of law and order and life and property must be protected from such men he sentenced eli spence to fourteen years penal servitude and the other prisoners who had evidently been led on by eli spence to ten years each such exemplary sentences had their due effect and although severe the general feeling was that it served them right the prisoners were staggered when they heard the sentences and eli spence muttered something to the effect that he would like to see the judge struck dead on the bench but there was more to follow this trial in the case of eli spence sergeant taylor had seen the effect the mention of wide awake's name had upon eli spence he saw wide awake when the prisoners were removed from the court and requested him to give him eli spence's reason for being startled at the name of joel chester at first wide awake was reticent but after some persuasion he said that his brother joseph chester had been mixed up in a case of robbery in san francisco in which eli spence had been ringleader to shield his brother and more especially to save the family name from disgrace wide awake who was very much like joseph chester had permitted himself to be arrested in his stead eli spence who was in the police at the time was discharged from the force owing to some irregularities on his part and managed to leave the country before his connection with the bank robbery was discovered wide awake as he may still be called communicated with his brother joseph chester who also left san francisco at the trial the evidence against wide awake who gave an assumed name was not sufficient to convict him but he felt keenly the disgrace that had been put upon him and he resolved not to disclose his real name again he said that he should not have disclosed it at the trial but he could not resist the temptation to see what effect it had upon eli spence and moreover he had heard his brother was dead but why did you stand your trial in place of your brother said sergeant tyler because he was young and had been led away by a lot of scoundrels and i wished to give him another chance said wide awake and did his conduct after this justify what you had done for him asked tyler no i am sorry to say it did not said wide awake but i can say no more on that subject the name of chester was not branded with infamy in the bank robbery case but since that time owing to my brother's actions i have been ashamed even to own to myself that my name was joel chester do you still think eli spence had a hand in henry bryce's death asked tyler yes i know the man well when he heard my name was joel chester he understood that i had known about his past life in san francisco but what connection has eli spence's life in frisco to do with henry bryce's death asked tyler you heard my story at munda said wide awake i have very little to add to it eli spence was at mr bryce's election meeting that night it's a clue for you to go upon 
the manner in which henry bryce met with his death is mysterious and resembles the method used by eli spence and others of the highflyer gang in frisco sergeant tyler thought for a few moments and then said i must see eli spence before he leaves darlinghurst i will try and see him now wide awake said what do you propose to do a little plan of my own i want to work out if they will let me sergeant tyler left wide awake and went to the governor of the jail what passed between them need not be related it suffices to say that the governor said at the conclusion of the interview it's a clever plan tyler if it succeeds you will beat the detectives on their own ground sergeant tyler went straight from the jail to wyndham hanworth's studio where luckily he found not only the artist but edward bryce you here sergeant said ted bryce in surprise yes i've come to borrow the painting of herbert golding the first one i mean he said whatever do you want it for asked ted i'm going to bait a trap with it said tyler explain what you mean said ted bryce don't talk in riddles i've just left the governor of the jail said tyler my plan i have explained to him and he thinks the idea clever it might not be fair in an ordinary case but in a matter of this kind it is admissible i want that picture to confront eli spence with ted bryce and wyndham hanworth looked at the constable in amazement will you permit me to take it to darlinghurst asked tyler certainly said wyndham but what has eli spence got to do with it listen for a few moments and i will explain said the constable my idea is this i may be wrong but it is feasible herbert golding we think knows something about the murder of your father mr bryce we saw how startled he was when he looked at that picture and also how he collapsed when mr hanworth alluded to the murder now from this i gather that if herbert golding did not commit the deed he may have seen it committed yes yes exclaimed ted bryce excitedly go on tyler i fancy i see what you're driving at if herbert golding saw your father murdered said tyler he would probably look as horrified as he does in that painting now presuming eli spence murdered your father mind it's only a supposition on somewhat flimsy evidence and he encountered herbert golding afterwards he would recognize the portrait as that of the man who had seen him commit the deed both herbert golding and eli spence were at your father's meeting that night it may be that eli spence followed your father intending to rob him and finding him able to make a desperate resistance he struck him a violent blow on the head mr bryce may have fallen into the water and eli spence if he was the man would thus be unable to rob him finding what he had done meant murder the man probably ran away and he may have encountered herbert golding it's an ingenious theory said ted bryce but surely herbert golding would have attempted to stop the man or raised a cry of alarm he may have had a reason for not doing so said tyler in that case if he thought mr bryce's death would be to his advantage he would let the murderer escape rather than risk a rescue ted bryce knew herbert golding had very good reasons for wishing henry bryce out of the way had not his unfortunate father hinted to mr sellers that he had found herbert golding out and perhaps had given his partner to understand such was the case i fear herbert golding had every reason to wish my father out of the way he said that makes my theory more practicable said tyler if herbert golding saw mr bryce knocked into the water and the murderer ran into him as he hurried away there would probably be a look of horror on golding's face similar to that in the picture if eli spence is the man he will show considerable alarm when he sees that portrait if my idea be correct he will know it is the face of the man who saw him kill henry bryce at the moment he recognises the portrait will be the time to wring a confession of his crime from him if he has committed one there were evidently no witnesses of the murder with the exception of golding because had there been so the police would have come across them before this if it is as i surmise herbert golding and eli spence will not be known to each other by name but the features of each other will be familiar to the other 
if eli spence recognises herbert golding's portrait then herbert golding must be brought face to face with eli spence it is not a very complicated matter when you come to work it out now you've explained it to us said ted bryce i must congratulate you you reason soundly and you've formed a perfectly feasible theory wide awake gave me a wrinkle or two said tyler he firmly believes eli spence had a hand in the affair from something he heard in the shearers camp when do you want the painting to try your experiment said wyndham hanworth at once said tyler and i should like both yourself and mr bryce to be present when eli spence sees it i am commencing to think my time has not been wasted after all said wyndham i thought when i was painting herbert golding's portrait it was a waste of energy and a most uncongenial occupation we have no time to lose said sergeant tyler let us go at once to darlinghurst the first painting of herbert golding was carefully wrapped up and tyler took it with him in a hansom to darlinghurst wyndham hanworth and ted bryce followed in another hansom and both were eagerly anticipating the result of sergeant tyler's plan End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain startling results on arriving at darlinghurst sergeant tyler took the picture to a room the governor had decided to bring eli spence into the picture was fixed in a conspicuous place and as in the studio a cover was over it that could be easily withdrawn edward bryce and wyndham hanworth were acquainted with the governor so there was no difficulty in their being present eli spence was surprised when a warder told him he had orders to take him to the governor of the jail that cursed old judge must have thought better of it and reduced my sentence he said with a grin not much fear of that said the warder you may consider yourself lucky you were not on your trial for murder eli spence gave a start and said what the do you mean what i say said the warder you might have killed two or three people in that row at munda in that case you would have found a rope around your neck for sure when eli spence entered the room there was another surprise in store for him at the sight of edward bryce wyndham hanworth and sergeant tyler he at once suspected their presence boded him no good eli spence was not a brave man at any time and therefore he quailed before the men he had attempted to injure without a word of explanation the governor keeping his eyes fixed upon eli spence signalled to wyndham hanworth to draw the cover off the picture eli spence stood directly in front of it so that herbert golding's face in the painting seemed to glare at him in a horrified amazement and terror when he saw it he gave a cry of fear and staggered back before he had time to recover himself the governor said the man whose portrait you see has confessed all he did not say what the confession was but eli spence in a voice trembling with fear said take it away he saw it all it was an accident i swear i never intended to kill him take those horrible eyes away he looked worse than that then you are the murderer of my father said ted bryce advancing towards eli spence i never meant to murder him stammered the wretched man now as white as a ghost you are not obliged to say anything that will incriminate yourself said the governor i'll confess the truth let me tell the truth now said eli spence he thought if he made a statement now and stuck to it he may yet save his wretched neck you must please yourself about that said the governor eli spence commenced to speak rapidly when the governor interrupted him and said whatever you say will be taken down and given in evidence against you upon your trial i don't care i'll speak out now said eli spence this is the statement made by eli spence as it was taken down in writing i was at mr bryce's election meeting i had heard a good deal about mr bryce at one time and another i frequently called at his office and asked for work on one of his stations 
I never saw the man whose picture was shown me today at Mr. Bryce's, nor do I know his name. I make this statement in answer to a question put to me. Mr. Bryce gave me money once or twice, but when he found out I had been mixed up in the shearing disturbances last season but one, he declined to give me more help. I had no grudge against him for this, but I heard when he went to his election meeting he was generally alone on his return home. I thought he would have money on him the night I went to his meeting, and I meant to threaten him, if I got a favourable chance, until he parted with some coin. When he left the meeting, I believe he went out with the man whose portrait I have seen. At all events, I saw them conversing. When Mr. Bryce was alone, he walked quickly, as though he was going to catch the ferry boat. He had some distance to go, and I followed him. He had to pass a dark spot near the harbour, and it was late, and I saw no people about. I went after him, and called out quietly, Mr. Bryce, Mr. Bryce. When he turned round, he did not at first recognise me, but no doubt thinking it was one of his supporters, he came up to me. He then recognised me, and I could see by his face he thought I was up to no good. You here, he said. You scoundrel, be off, or I will call the police. I did not hesitate then. I knew he would do so. I caught him by the throat and said, Hand over your money and I'll let you go. He would not give in, but caught me round the waist. He was a strong man for his age, and we had a desperate struggle. I saw we were nearing the water's edge, and I endeavoured to get loose from him, but he would not let me go. At last he tripped backwards over a stone and fell to the ground, and I heard his head strike heavily. His grasp relaxed, and before I knew what had happened, I'd shaken myself loose from him, and he rolled over into the harbour. I heard the splash as he fell into the water, and then I realised what had happened. I was terribly afraid. I could not swim, or I should have tried to save him. I never intended he should come to harm in that way. I stood dazed for a few moments, and then ran off, intending to call for assistance. I had not gone a dozen yards before I ran into a man, and from the expression of his face, it was exactly like that in the picture. I knew he must have seen everything. Who is it? said the man with a gasp. Mr. Bryce, I answered. Save him. I can't swim. I hurried on. I was too terrified at the thoughts of what I had done, and the consequences to me, if discovered, to pause for a moment. Where I went that night I hardly knew, but next morning I made my way up country, and as I had a little money with me, I got to the Burke district, and then joined the shearers' camp. I never knew what had happened until I got hold of a Sydney paper with an account of the inquest in it. I then commenced to wonder who the man was that I had seen when I ran away, and who I knew must have witnessed the struggle. That man I saw made no sign and gave no evidence. Then I thought he must have some reason for keeping in the dark. Perhaps he had a grudge against Mr. Bryce. At any rate, I meant to hunt him out when I got to Sydney and see what he had to say, because I felt he would never betray me and might be useful to me. That man could not have made any effort to save Mr. Bryce. Why I told him the name of the man who fell into the water, I do not know. It may have been that I thought, when he knew it was Mr. Bryce, he would make some effort to save him. The man did not try to detain me, nor did he follow after me or raise any cry of alarm. That is the whole truth about the matter. I have nothing more to say. On the strength of this confession, Herbert Golding was sent for, but he was nowhere to be found. His house was searched and inquiries made in every direction, but all to no purpose. The next day, after Eli Spence had made his confession, the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company smashed, and it was discovered that someone had abstracted several thousands of pounds from the safes. When Herbert Golding could not be found, suspicion naturally attached to him. On top of this came the rumour that Herbert Golding was wanted by the police on another charge connected with the death of the late Henry Bryce. The Sydney paper that gave a hint on a previous occasion that some startling revelations might shortly be expected in connection with the murder of Henry Bryce now proceeded to explain what had occurred. The statement was wildly exaggerated, but to some extent it was true, 
and it gradually got about that Herbert Golding was mixed up in the murder of his late partner. Then there was an authorised statement in the Sydney Morning Herald that Eli Spence, who had been sentenced to fourteen years for the attack on Munda Station, was to be put on his trial for the murder of Henry Bryce, and that he had made a full confession of all that had taken place in connection with the outrage. At one point there was no doubt whatever. The pious, sanctimonious Herbert Golding, MLA, had bolted. His character was pulled to pieces with remarkable rapidity, considering the elaborate care he had bestowed upon its building up. Much better men than Herbert Golding have had their characters mutilated behind their backs. As proof after proof of Herbert Golding's perfidy came to light, people were willing to believe almost any evil of him. His offences, which were many and great, were magnified until they assumed colossal proportions. It was even said that Herbert Golding had first bribed Eli Spence to murder Henry Bryce, and had then lured the unfortunate man from the election meeting to the scene of the tragedy. There was no more bitter denouncer of Herbert Golding than the vicar he had so long deceived. The reverend gentleman went about in an almost frantic state of mind. He lifted up his voice and gave vent to the most unchristian-like expressions of feeling. The dupe depositors in the amalgamated bank laid their ruin at Herbert Golding's door. He was cursed from the pulpit and cursed in the humble home of the working man. But where had he got to? That was the main question to solve. Mrs. Bryce reeled under the shock of Herbert Golding's base deception. She thought the bulk of her fortune had gone in the bank crash. Edward Bryce did not mean to undeceive her on that point at present. He thought she deserved to suffer. Ida Bryce gave her no sympathy, and Mrs. Bryce felt very much alone. Her one consolation lay in the fact that her engagement to Herbert Golding had not been made public. Edward Bryce meant to see Herbert Golding standing in the dock if money could procure that desirable consummation. Now he knew what Herbert Golding had been guilty of, he would not spare him. To his mind, the missing man was as much guilty of the death of his father as Eli Spence. He clenched his hands with rage as he pictured how Herbert Golding had stood by and made no attempt to save the drowning man. He placed unlimited money at the disposal of the detectives who were engaged in hunting Herbert Golding down. Eli Spence was put on his trial for the murder of Henry Bryce. His confession he strictly adhered to, and although the jury found him guilty, he was recommended to mercy because they believed he had no actual intention of committing murder. Sergeant Tyler thought a recommendation to mercy in the case of Eli Spence a mere mockery, and said so openly. Eli Spence's death sentence was, however, commuted to lifelong imprisonment. The way in which the portrait of Herbert Golding, painted by Wyndham Hanworth, had been used, caused quite a sensation. It was produced in court on the trial of Eli Spence, who swore it was the face of the man he had seen that night, and who must have witnessed all that had taken place. The newspapers made the most of the sensation, and there was a morbid desire on the part of the public to see this now celebrated portrait. Wyndham Hanworth had several offers for it. He was amused at some of them, for it was quite evident the portrait was regarded as a legitimate article to exhibit and make money out of. There had been no such sensation in Sydney for many years, and there was an eager desire on the part of a variety of individuals interested and otherwise, for the capture of Herbert Golding. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Who Did It?" by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ghost Wins Although Edward Bryce was very anxious Herbert Golding should be caught, he did not let his feelings in that direction interfere with his enjoyment. 
he naturally enough thought if the absconder was to be found the detectives would do it without further trouble on his part much of his time was spent with flora hanworth and in her society the gloom cast over him by recent events was dispelled edward bryce as before stated was not a city man he loved the country and flora hanworth was quite willing to make her home with him at munda or anywhere else he chose she loved him dearly and to her it mattered little where she resided so long as he was with her ida bryce would not leave mrs bryce now she was in trouble although she did not sympathize with her stepmother she pitied her mrs bryce when the first shock was over thought more of the loss of her money than of her intended husband she knew she was the dupe of a scoundrel and the thought was bitter to her i shall never be able to keep up this house now ida she said you are rich and when you marry you may have it with pleasure but i have no intention of marrying said ida and as for your leaving here i am sure ted would never allow that i thought you were engaged to mr hanworth said mrs bryce indeed said ida then you are mistaken mr hanworth has not even made love to me so i fail to see how i can be engaged to him but i know you like him ida said mrs bryce oh i like him well enough said ida but that is quite a different matter to loving him ted bryce often called to see his sister but he did not care to remain in his stepmother's house mrs bryce was anxious to learn all about the affairs of the amalgamated company but ted would not give her much information what he did tell her served rather to increase than allay her fears he was determined to punish her for her conduct and felt justified in doing so the handicap for the sydney cup was generally considered a good one and for a change the handicapper was not abused like a pickpocket the ghost had got seven stone and la belle eight stone four pound and ted bryce was quite satisfied with the phantom colt's weight sam fraser was delighted and considered the ghost's chance a first-class one he knew if the ghost managed to win the cup his luck would change for the better most trainers believe in luck and sam fraser was no exception to the general rule his run of bad luck landed him at munda and he had an idea that after all his experiences there were to stand him in good stead the history of the ghost sire was public property for an account of the celebrated phantom had appeared in print surrounded by such a halo of romance that ted bryce had been amused when he read the sensational story still there had been enough of the truth in it to make the ghost's work on the track attractive ted bryce made no secret of the chance he thought the colt possessed and much to sam fraser's disgust he had publicly stated in tattersall's club what the ghost was capable of doing when the ajc autumn meeting drew near the betting became brisk and although the ghost was not heavily backed plenty of people had put money on him wide awake who had returned to munda had given such a glowing account of the colt's progress that the station hands clubbed together and sent down a tidy sum to oxenham's to back him even the lads had put in their dollars with the rest and were as eager as the older hands to learn how the ghost went in his work the papers were in great demand and the morning gallops were read out by wide awake to an enthusiastic audience the ghost accompanied by rosy morn and la belle did one of the best goes of the morning over a mile and a half was sure to be read amidst an outburst of cheering startling cable intelligence had no charm for the munda hands they were uninterested in the information that mr gladstone was doing the continent or that the queen had gone to nice and they failed to recognise any particular charm in the report which was contradicted the next day that a well-known member of parliament contemplated a visit to australia the ghost was of far more importance to them than such items of news ted bryce had the natural enthusiasm of a true sportsman to see his horse win and although he did not bet heavily he was perhaps more interested in the result than others who plunged it was a glorious autumn day when the sydney cup was to be decided 
it was easter time and the holiday makers were in great force at randwick thousands of people were present and it was evident the cup was going to be an exciting and well contested race wyndham hanworth seldom visited a race course but he went with ida bryce his sister and ted bryce to see how the ghost would run they all thought of their ride after the phantom as they stood looking at sam fraser putting the finishing touches to the ghost if he can stay as well as his sire he ought to win said ted what a dance the old phantom led us that day it was the best ride i ever had said ida enthusiastically and what a narrow escape you had flora what should i have done had anything serious happened to you flora said ted bryce with a fond look and what should i have done had you been seriously wounded at munda she replied it is lucky for all of us both affairs turned out so well said ted mr sellers came up and after an all-round greeting said la belle seems very fractious mr bryce i do not think she will do her best you never can tell said ted mares are so uncertain how's the betting now quail is a favourite and the party behind him think he can't lose then forrester thinks his horse has a chance but bill's luck has been so bad lately i'm afraid he won't win if the ghost cannot win said ted bryce there's no man i would sooner see land the cup than mr forrester i hear he has a remarkably fine colt by carbine out of rosary he has said william sellers a regular beauty so he tells me the youngster has a cut of musket about him and has the markings of the old horse but here he comes he will tell you about it himself mr forrester joined the group and cast critical eyes on the ghost looks fit he said laconically sam fraser has not lost much of his knowledge at munda i think he'll win said ted bryce my fellow has a chance said mr forrester i'll save a hundred with you they are both about the same price in the betting very well said ted a hundred of the ghost for a hundred of romulus mr sellers tells me your carbine colt is a good one he is said mr forrester with a smile i'll give the boys down the banks with him if my old luck returns i'm sure i hope it will said ted you've had a long spell the other way we've had to declare a couple of pounds overweight for parker said sam fraser so you couldn't get down to seven stones sis said ted bryce no replied parker i done me best but it's a pinch for me to get down to seven stone two pound i don't mind going to a little trouble to ride for you mr bryce i hope you will manage to win said ted has fraser given you instructions how to ride the colt no said parker but he has given me a few hints which is better it does not do to hamper a fellow with too many orders in a race like this i think you are quite right said ted bryce ride your own race sis and win if you can i shan't blame you in any case thank you said parker some men are only too ready to think ill of a jockey sis parker was a well-known and capable rider a clever young fellow with excellent hands and just the jockey for a colt like the ghost when he came out of the weighing room with the magenta jacket and black cap on there was a disposition to back the ghost more freely it could easily be seen that the jockey had numerous followers the ghost was a bit fractious and scattered the crowd in the paddock as he lashed out and tried to get his head loose from sam fraser who had hold of the bridle when in the straight however he soon settled down to his work and galloped freely there were thirty starters and mr watson soon had them off to a level start with the machine it was not a race full of incident as some sydney cups have been for at the end of a mile more than half the horses were out of it the ghost had been lying fifth or sixth and going well on the rails as they neared the sheds parker commenced to creep up to quail romulus la belle and hero and close in the wake of the colt followed pilot and chesterfield the pace had not been fast and the jockey felt the ghost was going well and had plenty left in him as they rounded the bend quail and romulus ran wide and in an instant parker had taken advantage of the opening on the rails and brought the ghost with a smart run cleverly done said ted bryce he's got a splendid position now and there's not much danger of a block at the ledger stand there were shouts of quail and the favourite wins 
then came romulus wins and the crimson and white jacket for a moment looked dangerous hero next caused a cry from the excited crowd as he forged ahead in mr oxenham's popular colours but parker had been keeping his eyes open he felt the ghost was not going too well now the critical pinch had come and he meant to nurse him until the last moment hang him said fraser to himself either the jockey or the colt is licked blessed if i know which it is you can bet it's not sis that's licked said an enthusiastic admirer of parker he don't know what it is to be licked but sam fraser knew when a jockey came down to seven stone two pound as parker had done it was liable to take a bit out of him if the race had been uninteresting the finish made up for it and so intense was the excitement that a momentary hush fell upon the crowd there is nothing stranger than these sudden changes in a vast racecourse crowd in their intense emotion the people seem incapable of giving vent to their feelings when four horses are racing neck and neck at the finish of a race hardly a sound is heard until one of the four gets his head in front then there is a frantic roar in favour of the horse with this slight advantage it was so in this instance just below the distance the ghost on the rails quail hero and romulus had all drawn level the four horses were desperately struggling to gain a slight advantage it was a battle royal worth seeing four heads level necks outstretched nostrils wide eyes glowing fiercely with excitement and every nerve and sinew trained to endure strained to the utmost tension four jockeys all adepts in their profession riding these horses with consummate coolness and judgment the least mistake each jockey knew would be fatal the slightest move too soon and defeat would certainly follow and so these four horses and riders came on towards the judge's box quail faltered and his jockey had to ride him he fell back astride hero reeled and had to be straightened and romulus's rider felt the time had come parker saw everything that happened in that brief moment he saw quail falter and hero roll and then with joy he saw the rider of romulus raise his whip still as a mouse sat parker on the ghost he was riding a splendid race he felt he should just get the colt home he dared not move he knew the excited crowd would think he was throwing the race away he knew the public would much rather have seen him riding for dear life and as they thought getting every ounce out of the colt under pressure he knew if he lost stewards who were not the best of judges might condemn him and that even edward bryce and sam fraser might say he ought to have made more use of his mount at the finish knowing all this he sat still and let the ghost do his best for he alone knew it was the only way to win the race the ghost was doing his best had his jockey attempted to make him do more than his best the result would have been disastrous and still the ghost could not shake off romulus only a few more strides and the strain would be over parker was holding the ghost well together and at the same time letting him do his level best he saw the judge's box on his left and he saw the level mark on the board on his right he glanced to his left and just saw the tip of romulus's nose a short head he muttered and i have it but he was anxious to see the numbers go up i beat you jim he said as he rode back with the rider of romulus blessed if i know sis i thought it was a dead heat no i just got home he was right the clerk of the course rode up to the ghost and then sis parker knew he had won the race End of chapter twenty six